If you have your Bible, open up to Mark chapter 6. Um, I want to, while you're turning over there, um, just say thank you to the number of people who reached out to me and my family yesterday. Uh, yesterday, uh, if you don't know, I was in a uh, pretty uh, horrific car accident um, and uh, with my two boys. And um, they're okay, and I'm okay. And uh, praise God for that. Um, it was uh, very scary, and um, and yet we're uh, we all walked away uh, just really blessed um, to not have a whole lot of uh, injuries or anything else like that um, in impacting uh, our life right now. And um, and so, um, but it, but it could have been a lot worse. And um, and so we're just man, I, I I'm praising God today. I have a reason to praise God today. He woke me up this morning. He put breath in my lungs so I can sing louder today and I can preach harder today um, because, man, I got another day to do uh, things I love, uh, like spend time with my family and preach God's word. These are the things I love most. And um, so I'm excited to do this and be here to do this, standing upright and, uh, and healthy after what happened yesterday. So thank you guys for your prayers, and thank you for your concern. Thank you for your texts and just your, your thoughtfulness um, and your kindness toward us. We really appreciate that. It's so beautiful to have people who love you and a family who will reach out in times of need and care for you, and uh, we felt that yesterday uh, in a big way. So thank you so much. Um, we're in uh, Mark chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, grab one of ours. Grab one of the uh, Bible journals. Turn to one of those page numbers there. Uh, uh, but we're in Mark chapter 6. We're going to be verses 1 through 13 today. And uh, I'm excited to, uh, to, to talk to you guys uh, about what, what Jesus is doing here in Mark 6. So uh, we're just going to read uh, kind of this first section together. And then we'll kind of move on, uh, make some application. Then read the second section, make some application, and wrap things up. All right, but let's, uh, let's dive in in verse 1 right here. All right, it says, uh, He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Hoses and Judas and Simon are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty works there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. All right. So let's take a second and just let's talk about this section for a second. So Jesus heads back to his hometown of Nazareth. Uh, and we know uh, that that's his hometown because of other uh, things said about him in other gospels. But, um, but he heads back there and uh, everybody recognizes him. Everybody knows who he is. He's the oldest child in this very large family apparently, right? He has at least four brothers. He has some sisters as well. And so they recognize him as Mary and Joseph's son, uh, the, the oldest one and probably the one who was, you know, a really great con carpenter, great, um, you know, construction worker uh, and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and so he's, he shows up and he and he starts to teach in the synagogue though right and this may be would happen at times as a child you might read the scriptures if you were a young boy growing up in the synagogue but you probably weren't going to give very much of an interpretation um, and especially you wouldn't give an interpretation without saying this is from this person right Jesus shows up and he begins to teach and what he's doing is he's giving his own interpretation He's just, he's just telling people what the Bible says. And he's speaking with this wisdom that people are just awestruck by. 
And they know, like, he's, he's not gone to rabbinical school. He was a carpenter's kid. He didn't, he didn't make his way off to Jerusalem and study under some great rabbi. Nor did he go to some smaller city and study under some lousy rabbi, right? Like, he, he didn't do, he, he, was, he, was, he, was just a, he was just a normal guy. And they're like, what is this? Wisdom. Where is this coming from? And it's so interesting to me when this question comes out because it, it just, it jumps off the page at me because I think, I think there's something true about Jesus' life here that can be true for us as well. That there is, a, there is an abundant wisdom that comes and is a byproduct of walking in close proximity with God. Jesus walks in such close proximity with God that he has wisdom that no one else has ever heard before, that no one else has ever experienced before. He dedicates his life to walking with God, studying the scriptures, spending time with him in prayer, in solitude, in listening to God speak to him and share his will with him. And he's able to then go about his life and live and do the will of God with this unbelievable wisdom and teach others this wisdom. And people take notice. They just don't know where it came from. But the interesting thing is, is that James, the brother of Jesus, by the way, says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask, and God will give generously to those who ask. If you want wisdom, Ask God to give you wisdom. And then create and carve out some time in your life to walk in close proximity with Jesus and with God. Carve out some time to open up the scriptures. And before you start reading, just say, hey, God, can, uh, can you show me some wisdom today? And he says, if you ask him to do that, he will do that. When you sit down and you begin to pray, maybe over a big decision that you have, ask him, God, would you give me wisdom to hear your voice over every other voice so I might discern and do the will of God? So many of us wanna know how to do the will of God, don't we? What, what, what is God's will for my life? What is God's will for me and my family in this situation? What does God want me to do with my finances here? What is God, what do you want, right? Because we want to do what God wants us to do, don't we? Right, for the most part, except when we don't, right? <laughs> except until he makes his will really clear and we're like, ah, I don't really want to do that. But we, for the most part, we start with this disposition of like, I actually want to do what God wants me to do. And if that's our heart, then let us, let us go to the scriptures and search for his will. Let us go into prayer and ask him for wisdom that we might know his will and that he might speak to us and make his voice loud and clear so that we might be able to discern that and do that. Because he says, if we ask for it, he'll give it to us. That's all Jesus did. Jesus spent time with the Father. He carved out space so that he could be with God. And he dedicated himself to the study of scripture and God showed him wisdom, a greater wisdom than anyone else. Now, are you gonna be able to perfectly discern that like Jesus? No, probably not. Are you going to, are you going to perfectly discern his voice when he speaks to you and not make a mistake? No, probably not. That's what makes Jesus, Jesus and us, us but it doesn't mean he's not gonna give you more wisdom in certain areas and certain times towards certain things. What we need to do is have a hunger for that wisdom. And if that hunger for wisdom, if we have that, it leads us closer to Jesus, closer into relationship with him and the Father so that he might speak and show us those things. But they can't get outside of their box. We've talked about putting Jesus in a box, right? A lot during the book of Mark. I, I don't, and we, maybe we should call Mark the gospel of the box. I don't know. But uh, he's like challenging people all, like almost every chapter to take Jesus out of the box of what's possible and what Jesus can do. And, uh, but, but inside his own town, he cannot break down the box. 
He cannot break down the barriers that they've put up. They do not believe and they will not believe that he is anything more than a carpenter's kid. Mary's son. James and Judas's brother. They cannot think of Jesus in, as, as anything greater or anything more than that. And their unbelief keeps them from experiencing all the power of Christ. See, the reality is, is that unbelief will always hinder the power of God doing something in us and through us and to us. It will always hinder. Our unbelief will always hinder the power of God. The difference in these people and, uh, and Jairus and the woman who had a bleeding disorder that we talked about last week. Go back to chapter five. The difference is not Jesus. <laughs> Jesus has the same power here in chapter six as he had in chapter five. Can we all agree on that? The difference is Jairus and this woman who was bleeding had unbelievable, audacious, and bold faith. And nothing was going to silence their faith or keep their faith from getting them to Jesus so that he could do something for them, to them, through them. It is their unbelief, it's their unbelief that keeps Jesus' power at bay. Can you believe that? Can you believe that the power of God needs your faith and my faith to be manifest in our life? You may, man, I feel like I just haven't experienced the power of God in my life in a really, really tangible way. I wonder if that's because we don't have enough faith the difference is not Jesus the difference is faith God works through faith he saves through faith the Bible says we are saved by grace through faith that means we can't even have salvation without faith even if it's offered to us even if he is powerful enough to save, he will not save without faith. God is working through faith. And we have to have this belief. We can't walk around with this unbelief. This unbelief hinders his power from being at work in our lives in tangible, tangible ways. But there is a group of people in this chapter who really do have a lot of faith. Actually, a couple groups of people. So let's look at that. All right. Chapter, or chapter 6, verse 7 says, And he called the twelve, and he began to send them out two by two, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and to not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. And so they went out and they proclaimed that the people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So... Jesus gets the 12 together and he turns the 12 disciples into 12 apostles. The word apostles just means sent ones. That means to be sent out. That's what the word apostles means. Uh, and, uh, and so these are the sent ones of Jesus. They're sent out to do the work. But I, but I think there's a key thing here in Jesus' strategy when it comes to discipleship and when it comes to evangelism uh, and, and when it comes to being sent um, that God does this in, in a group. That evangelism is really a group effort. Evangelism is a group effort. You look, at, you look at the disciples here. You look at even Jesus himself. He calls disciples to him to go out before he preaches and teaches. He calls a team, right? He sends out two by two. The book of Acts, you have this team of people kind of centered in Jerusalem. They begin to recruit more leaders and more leaders and more leaders. And then they start sending leaders to other places throughout the world to plant new churches. But it's always a team. Paul and Barnabas, a team. 
Then it becomes Paul, Silas, and Timothy, a team. And it becomes Barnabas and John Mark, a team. Right? Wherever you see evangelism taking the world by storm, it's always done in a group of at least two or more. Of at least two or more. Very rarely will you see this happen, just one person going and taking the world by storm. One person might get a lot of the credit because they might be the predominant voice of the two, but it's always a team. And I think this is so interesting that oftentimes when we think about evangelism, when we think about evangelism, we think about it as an individual endeavor, right? Like, I'm like, hey, you know what? Go reach your coworkers for Christ. And you're like, all right. And then you head off into the workplace and you start trying to reach your coworkers for Christ. And then pretty soon you're like, ah. Why, why don't we pay better attention to what Jesus is doing here? And why don't we go into our workplace and try and find one other friend that loves Jesus as much as we do? Befriend that person. Become as close to that person as we can become with this hope and this intent that we might light up our workplace for Christ together. That if someone doesn't receive our message, we can just wipe the dust off our feet and move on to the next person. We can do that a whole lot more enthusiastically, and, and we can do that a whole lot more easily if we have a support of another than trying to go at it alone. And so that's what, if, if, if I were in the marketplace, that's the strategy that I would try. Is can I build a relationship with one other really strong believer in my workplace? And can we just agree that, hey, we might invite one at a time to lunch, one at a time to the table for coffee, one at a time over to the house for dinner, one at a time to go to a Canes game with us, whatever it might be, and just love those people like Jesus and try and offer them something better. But let's do it together so that when things don't go well, we can keep each other encouraged and keep moving on keep doing the work that God has for us to do. But I also love this section really paints a picture of what the progression of discipleship looks like. That there is a progression to discipleship. These guys have been with Jesus for probably about a year now, maybe a year and a half. Um, and, uh, and so they've been with Jesus for a while. They've spent a lot of time with Jesus. They've heard Jesus' teachings. They've heard Jesus' stories. They've heard his parables. They've heard it all. And, and they've been with him. They've seen what he can do. But they, they've, they've also seen who he goes after. That he goes after the, the marginalized. That he goes after the lowly. That he touches the unclean. That he comes in contact with people that no one else would come in contact with. And he has compassion for those who are afraid. He has compassion for those who are hurting. He has empathy for those who are in a difficult situation or a difficult circumstance. And their heart begins to change. The system that they grew up in didn't have any compassion or any empathy or any like love for those people and yet they go out. When Jesus sends them, who do they go to? They go to those kinds of people. They go to the people who have been marginalized. They go to the people on the fringes. They go to the people who are demon possessed, who need healing, who are struggling. The same people Jesus went to because they have begun to adopt his character. They begin to adopt his characteristics. They begin to, to begin to love like him and live like him. And that's birthed out of being with him and seeing who he really is. And then they're unleashed to go and do what he does. Do you see this? He hands them the keys and he says, now you guys go do what I've been doing. What has Jesus been doing? He's been preaching to repent and turn, turn around. Turn around, for the kingdom of God is at hand, right? And what does that say these disciples are doing? They're preaching and telling people to repent, just like Jesus. And they're healing sick people, just like Jesus. They're casting out demons, just like Jesus. 
And it starts by Jesus calls them. They, they accept this invitation to just come and live life with Jesus. You've been invited. Did you know that? You aren't forced to be with Jesus. He isn't going to hold your hand to the fire and say, if you don't come and read your Bible with me tomorrow morning, out, out with you. You know, he's not, he's not just, he is inviting you in. He's saying, I love you. I want to have a relationship with you. Just come. Come, be with me. Let me show you how I live life. And then as you live life with Jesus, you become like Jesus just by being in proximity with him. And then you go out and you do the things that he does. So if you ever want to know, well, what is Lake Springs Church all about? Lake Springs Church is all about helping people be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what Jesus did because that's what discipleship looks like. Discipleship doesn't start with like, hey, let's get you in here and get you serving and start doing stuff, all this kind of stuff. Let, let's get you in here and make sure you're giving money and all of it. Like, all of that stuff will come if we can get you to be with Jesus and get you to fall in love with him. We don't need you to get you to fall in love with the church. We need to get you to fall in love with Jesus. Start living life with him. Start becoming like him. Start loving him like he loves, living like he lives. And then you can start doing the things that he does, offering freedom and doing ministry for uh, people who need ministry. That's what our church is all about, is trying to help people go on this journey and on this progression. Now, there is something, though, to be said about the faith that it takes to go on this progression. I mean, this is a faith-filled journey. You have to have faith to do what Jesus is calling you to do. <laughs> Jesus looks at these guys and says, um, hey, by the way, I want you to go out two by two, but don't take your money, don't take your clothes, and don't take your food. Are there any, like, are there three other basic necessities that you guys can think of that are more important than those three things? Like if Jesus said to you right now, oh, by the way, I would like you to give me all your money, like give, like just take all your, your pantry and your refrigerator, empty it out and give it away, and then also empty all your closets except for one change of clothes. <laughs> and you're like, uh, you, no, not really, really? Like, <laughs> so here's, here's the deal. What is Jesus doing by telling him to live this way? Is he saying that in order to be my disciple, you have to be poor? No. What he's saying is I want to make sure that I remove every possible barrier for you putting your full trust and your full faith in me. If you put your faith in your possessions, in your finances, in your food. If you put your faith in those things and your, your faith isn't fully devoted to me, you can't be my disciple. You have to get rid of the barriers, the things that you have more hope in than you have in Jesus. the things that potentially could keep you from following him and doing what he really wants to do with your life. Here's the reality is that these men, at one time, Jesus walked along the shore of the Sea of Galilee and he said, hey, come follow me. And they dropped their nets, their livelihood, everything that they knew how to provide and make money. Now Jesus calls them. He's been providing for them. He's been making ways. It's been going crazy. And they, and they now he's like, all right, hey, hey, um, what I need to do, I'm going to send you on on this mission. You can't take any of the money we have. You can't take any of the food we have. And don't take any extra clothes with you. Just live off the hospitality of other people 
and the charity of other people and the care and concern that other people have. And when they hear the gospel and they are, are transformed and, and captivated by the good news of Jesus, let those people take care of you. I mean, this is, that's, a, that's a really hard thing, right? But then he's going to say some things to them, and we're going to get to those things in chapter 10. But he's going to say some things to a couple of them where he's going to say, um, <laughs> can you drink the cup that I drink from? Meaning, can you die like I'm going to die? And then he says, you actually are going to drink the cup that I'm going to drink from. You are going to die on a cross like me. And they do. They lay down their life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. They pay whatever it costs for the gospel of Jesus Christ. They give it all up. That's faith. And this is just the next step. We haven't got to the last step yet. We won't get to the last step until you get to, like, you know, the end of the Bible. But what, what Jesus is doing is saying, I'm gonna, if you're my disciple, I'm going to invite you, and then I'm going to challenge you to just give up more and give up more and give up more until you give it all up. Because if you want to be my disciple, you have to not seek your life, but you must lose it. That's the cost of following Jesus. And these guys are willing to pay it. But what I love about this is that when they take this step of faith, Jesus shows up and he provides for them. When I, um, <laughs> when I first went into ministry, um, it's very funny, I uh, had, a, had a friend of mine, actually not, a, not just a friend, he was a friend, but he was also my professor in college, and, uh, and he came up to me one day and said, hey, Derek, I want you to fill out this application. He was one of my references on my first set of resumes that I sent out to churches when I was trying to get a job in college, or after college, and... Um, and he goes, you know, I keep getting all these phone calls from all of these, like, podunk country churches, and I think if you were to go there, you would probably, like, run through them like a bullet train and destroy those congregations. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and he said, I think it might be better if you just went out and started planting churches. <laughs> now, here's what I knew about planting churches, Okay. Cool people got to plant churches, all right? Uh, and people who didn't want a paycheck got to plant churches. <laughs> so if you wanted to plant a church, you had to raise your own salary, right? Like, that was the idea. Like, you want to be a church planter, like, call some people on the phone, start raising some money, and then go plant a church. Uh, and I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm going to, I want benefits, I want the whole package, you know, like, just give me, give me what I can get. So I, so I took a job in, uh, in central Kentucky. Um, and it, it didn't go well. I, I ran through that church like a bullet train. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and I was 23, super immature. That also had something to do with it. But, um, but <laughs> I, it, it, I lasted a year there before I said, you know what? I'm ready to raise my salary. And so I started raising my salary, and God provided. He said, if I call you to do something, I'll make a way for you to do it. If I call you to do something, I'll make a way for you to do it. Um, in 2015, um, I went to, left, uh, our family left Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, we, uh, we went to, um, we went to uh, Georgia, Augusta, Georgia, to plant a new church in Augusta. Didn't know a soul. So we just like parachute dropped into Augusta, Georgia. Had no idea anyone. Didn't know a single person that lived there uh, when we when we showed up. Uh, by the time we left, we knew about you know a hundred people. And uh, but it was the hardest three years of ministry we ever did. 
And partly because of what I talked about earlier is we didn't go with anybody. We didn't, we didn't take anybody with us. We went alone. And, um, but man, like when we raised money, God provided. Right? Um, <clears throat> but what I think about, and I think about this every week, I really do. Every week before I get up here and I preach, I think about the fact that, you know what? My livelihood depends on you. The livelihood of my family depends on you. Our ability to pay our bills, our ability to feed our kids, our ability to do um, the work that God has called us to do and the ministry that he's called us to do and dedicate our lives to this service depends on you. And I am so grateful for people like you. The same is true for David, the same is true for Brian, the same is true for Jenny. All of our livelihood depends on the generosity and the hospitality of the, the people that go to this church. We could not do the work that God has called us to do if you weren't giving in faith to make that possible. We also couldn't support the many other people who have dedicated their lives to the service of the gospel around the world and around this, around this area and around the country uh, if, if you guys weren't being generous. And so I just want to say thank you for that because I, I only get to do this because of you. I only get to do this in a place that I love with people that I love because of you and that means the world to me so thank you for having enough faith to trust God and say hey we want to do whatever we can to help make sure the kingdom of God is growing and it's coming here to Holly Springs as it is in heaven that's a really powerful thing really powerful thing but those are both acts of faith somebody's got to have the faith to go somebody's got to have the faith to give in order for the kingdom to grow and in order for the kingdom to grow. So that's, that's the thing. It's a, it's a faith that, that, that challenges us and moves us. And when we have this faith, God can do a lot, more than we could ever imagine, in us and through us and to us. If we just have faith, faith enough to trust him, faith enough to go where he calls us to go, do what he calls us to do, give what he calls us to give, let go of what he calls us to let go of. So here's what I want to challenge you to, because I like to challenge people. It's like my thing. I don't ever back down from a fight, uh, <laughs> Unless somebody a lot bigger than me is fighting. Uh, then, I, then I run like a scaredy cat. Uh, so, um, but here's what I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to ask yourself, and I think you might have to get alone with God and his word. Maybe spend some time alone in prayer to find the wisdom to discern his will in this area. But I want you to really ask yourself, I want you to challenge yourself, to ask the question, what is the next risky step that God is calling me to take as a disciple of, of his? As his follower, what is the next risky step he's calling me to take right now? And maybe the next risky step means that you're going somewhere, that he's got a job for you to do. And you just gotta trust that he's gonna make a way because he said, this is what I'm calling you to. This is where I want you to go. This is what I want you focused on. This is what I want you to give your time and attention to. I want you to go do this. But maybe there's also this aspect of the next risky thing that he's, that he's calling you to do is to let go of something that you are holding on to. Let go of something that you have so tightly within your grasp because you think that that's what gives you safety. That you think that's what gives you security. You think that that's what gives you hope. You think that that's what ultimately um, it, it, it sustains you. Maybe that's something financial, maybe it's not. Maybe that's a relationship that you're, you know isn't good for you but you don't wanna let it go. Maybe it's not. But just ask yourself, what is the next 
risky step that he's calling me to take and take that step and then get back in the quiet and discern the next step and discern the next step and discern the next step and that is what it looks like to walk with God and follow Jesus and be his disciple constantly taking the next risky step asking him God I want to do your will I want to do what you have for me give me the wisdom to know discern and do your will right now whatever situation it might be and maybe you get to a place like these disciples Hopefully we all get to a place like these disciples where we want nothing more than we want Jesus. And we'll give it all up, every last breath, for his kingdom. But it starts by taking the next risky step. So what might that be for you? Take it. I promise, I promise you will not regret taking that risk if it truly is what God desires for you. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for just your word and um, men of faith ordinary, unschooled men and women who took risky steps over and over and over again. God, I pray that if there's anything that we're holding on to right now in this room, we would let it go. Maybe for some of us, It's letting go of the nets and choosing to follow you for the first time and just trusting, okay, God, I have no idea what this means. I have no idea what this looks like. You don't answer a whole lot of questions when when you call people to follow you. You just say, come and see what it's going to be like. So we just got to trust and have faith. God, whatever that might be, if somebody needs to just come and follow you for the first time, maybe that next risky step is someone who's been following you for a long time, but they're still holding on to something in their old life. They're still holding on to something that's, that's leading them further and further away from you and not closer and closer toward you. God, maybe it's, maybe it's something financial. Maybe you're calling somebody to, to, to just bless um, a missionary somewhere around the world right now. They're afraid to make that step. They're afraid to take that step. They're afraid of what that might mean. to just support your kingdom, the ramifications that that might have and their personal finances, whatever that might be, God, God, I I just pray that you will just give them ears to hear your voice louder than every other voice. As they dive into your word and as they spend time with you in prayer, God, I pray that your voice would be loud and clear and that they'd be able to take the next risky step to follow you and trust you with their whole life and their whole heart. God, we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.